met this girl at Starbucks a little while ago. Maybe she should come to the gig tonight. Well, anyway, thanks for having me. And I've been so many places this summer. It's been crazy, but it's been wonderful. I was really looking forward to coming here to Moscow because I've never been here before. And it's amazing because I really feel comfortable here. I feel like it's part of me. So the reason I'm here is because of this guy right here who, who started Facebooking me. And I didn't even know who it was. And then come to find we played in Boston together. What, about four years ago, three years? Yeah. And, you know, you see so many people in your life and then people e email you or face, and face you and you forget. And, and I was like, oh, I don't know this guy. I don't know how he plays. I don't know who he is. Oh, I'm going to Russia. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then I realized, you know, not only is it the kid who plays genius music, the country really agrees with me, so it was good. I'll give you a little history of my about myself and my playing, and then, you know, if you have any questions, which I feel like you do already, you can ask me anything. Are you all saxophone players? Yes. Except for this guy, right? But he used to play sax. Do you really used to play saxophone? Let's play accordion. Do you? Oh, God, you too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Um, you know, then we can talk about anything from, you know, mouthpiece, breathing, how do you play, articulation, no articulation, whatever, okay? And then I'll go into a little bit about the triadic approach. And then I'll tell you who I'm sponsored by and my mother, okay? My mother sponsors me. How do you say your mother? And your mama. Mama. <laughs> it's Italian, huh? Okay. So... I grew up in a musical family, actually, from Mama, and her, her brother, my uncle Rocco, was the main teacher of all of us in the family, and we were all saxophone players. So my uncle Rocco was my mother's brother, and then his son, my cousin Richie, played saxophone, and then I played saxophone, and my uncle Joe played drums, and my cousin Paul, you know, it just goes on and on. So I grew up in a family where music was around me from birth, you know. So, I, you know, there's pictures of me crawling around the drums when I was like one and a half years old and like crawling while they were playing and then getting my head caught between the bass drum and the bass pedal, and, you know, and going like that. It was wild. You see these pictures of yourself. So I grew up in a musical family and my uncle Rocco had this sound, it's an Italian saxophone sound that was handed down to me through the generations from my uncle to his son to me. And we all learned the sound because of my uncle Rocco. And the first person I ever met that had a sound that was related to that was Joe Lovano. And when I met him at Berkeley when I was about 20 years old and then later on <clears throat> I was on the road and I was actually in his town and he picked me up and took me to his house and it was like the, the exact situation uh, as me like Italian family uh, mother his father played saxophone big T and we had like the stereotype relationship in terms of growing up and I always remember oh, the kid has a great sound because his father taught him about sound and for me I grew up learning that it's sound before anything you play the young guys I hear play today that come to Berkeley or, or anyone I hear have great technique great facility they can play all the ideas and the licks and the bebop blah 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 but no sound and it doesn't do anything for me you know people I think people will recognize you more for your sound than they will by what you play because no one knows what you're playing you know 
you you can't expect someone in the audience to say, oh wow, uh, Evgeny's playing a tritone away, and he's playing these ideas up a half step, then he's moving down to a pentatonic, rah, rah, rah. They don't. They, no one has any idea, but they can relate to a beautiful sound. Anyone, they, and even a non-musician can relate to a beautiful sound. You understand what I'm saying? Beautiful sound is beautiful sound. Okay? So that that's the way I look at it. So I grew up with this great sound and was able to apply what I learned from my family. My family taught me about playing melody, which you don't hear anyone play melody when they play music. You know, when people play a ballad, they play but you never hear anyone play the melody, just the melody. That's a real challenge. And you can try that when you practice. Just playing the melody, it's really hard. Let me see if I'm, I don't know if I'm. people play melody is because your responsibility is to hold long notes, to hold notes longer than two or three beats. When you hear people hold notes longer than two or three beats, that means they practice long tones. If you don't hear people hold notes longer than two or three beats, that means they practice just a bunch of crap and they don't sustain they play, they move around so much. That's a disguise. When anyone plays too many notes, it's because they're not confident enough about holding one note. That makes sense? Everyone understand that? Okay, so that's, that's how you can tell. When I listen to a person, I can tell exactly how they practice by what they play. It's an interesting, you know, it's interesting. That's just the way I look at it, because after doing this for so long, to become really aware of how people play by what they play and what they don't play. It's interesting, you know? It's like listening to someone talk. <laughs> and you see me changing the reed because here in Moscow, the reeds either play really hard or really soft. There's no in the middle, you know? I'm trying to find out, you know, where's, I can't find it. They're either really forte, you find that here? Are the reeds either really hard or really soft? Hey, <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Right now, I mean, tonight might be another story, so I don't know. I'm going to bring my girl with me. Anton <laughs> says he has a blade, so if you need to, to shout it. Who's that, Anton? No, Anton, I never do that. I never do because if I if I do it a little bit, I destroy the reed. Just do a little bit. Yeah, no, I can't. It becomes too. It's too uneven for me, you know. So anyway, I I try to play the the reed as natural as possible. And with the you know I play. You know, let me tell you that I'm I endorse Rico jazz. Well, I play Rico jazz select. Of course, they have so many other ones, but. Um, these are the only reeds that play for me. They've been like that all my life. It's amazing. I tried playing the other brands, the blah, 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 and the blah, 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 <laughs> but they don't work all my life. And it's always been Rico. So right now I'm playing Rico Jazz Select. I'm going between <clears throat> four hard filed and four hard unfiled. And I play a 10 star Jody Jazz. Um, you know, it sounds like the combination is really heavy, but the way Jody makes the mouthpiece, for me, when he, when he put, makes a 10 star, it's, it's not, you know, unbearable. I can handle it, you know, I mean, you could hear. <laughs> to me, that's my soft sound, you know.
that's subtone low B flat with a four hard. Well, this one's filed, file four hard with the ten style. So, for me, it seems to work. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not telling everyone to run out and buy a, a ten star because my students at Berkeley, as soon as they see that, they run out and they buy a ten star, and they kill themselves because it's too big. Some of them get it though. You know, uh, some of the guys, like some guys come in and they really, they, their, their airstream is really strong and they're playing like a seven, which is not too big. And then I tell them to, to just play a nine or a 10 and they fight me for a while. But then once they put the mouthpiece on, they realize, oh my God, it feels great. It's because their airstream was big enough to be able to handle that. You know, I mean, I would never tell anyone to play. Uh, I would never tell anyone to play a ten star if I didn't think they could handle it. Because if you play a big mouthpiece and you blow too hard, then you get a hernia. You know, something will happen to you. You know what I'm saying? Because it's it's too much. But when I hear people that have a big airstream, I try to get them to play a bigger mouthpiece that suits. You know what they, what I think they would be good for. I try to tell a young musician, play what fits you. You know, and the t the teacher can can suggest what he thinks he should play, but it's up to the student to find out because he's the only one, or he or she is the only one that knows by the feel of how he's playing what it should be. Um, it's like trying to teach. A teacher doesn't really teach the student. Everyone understand that? The teacher does not teach the student. The teacher teaches the student how to teach himself or herself. Okay, think about that. That's the concept. Because when, when people come to study with me or with the teacher, they, they get so close because they, they want you to tell them all of the secrets. Like, I, I feel like I become their father and they're my sons and daughters. That's how close you get, but um, I don't, I mean, you know, I, it's like a kind of a, an analogy, but I want them, I'm trying to teach them how to teach themselves so that, because you're not gonna be with me, you'll only be with me for four years, maybe two out of four years at Berkeley, and after that, you're on your own. And sometimes the student becomes very dependent on the teacher. Everyone understand what I'm saying? And that's when you have, you know, you, this, the point of separation is when you graduate from school. Once you graduate, you're on your own. You go to New York, you're on your own, Evgeny. You can't be like, oh, Mr. Guy's on. Uh, this guy told me that I suck. Well, <laughs> what do you want me to do, <laughs> right? Well, he's told me I play great. I said, are you sure? Did you play great? You know. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying to you, it's like that's a very important thing that you understand when you study that you, the teacher teaches you how to teach yourself. And that's what my teacher did, Joe Viola. Um, when you were there, did you study with Joe? Yes. I studied with Joe when I was 16 years old. I was still in high school. And he knew my Uncle Rocco, so he would let me come and take lessons. And they would never let young people take lessons, but he let me in because it was like an Italian thing, like, you know, you know, he let me in. So I got like one year before I went to Berkeley, thank God, because I really needed it. So Joe, Joe was like a Buddha to me, you know, Buddha. Like, but he was like God. Even if he wasn't talking to me and I was sitting next to him, I felt like I was learning something because just to sit next to this guy, it's like, wow, what this energy I'm getting was like crazy, you know? But he was like, shh. You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't mind me. This is great, man. I love that. These girls have so much personality, I, I keep looking at them. It's crazy, man. All right, the big thing, the biggest thing I try to tell all the players is not to use too much tongue. Because articulation is an interrupter. 
it interrupts the flow of playing jazz. Okay, so in classical it's used, but it's a different style of music and it, it's really a big part of what these uh, classical ideas are about. But in jazz, jazz needs to flow. And I think what I see is a lot of the students come into playing jazz from a classical background. So they're still articulating with a heavy tongue, like T, like ta 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 So what I try to do is I try to get them to lose the articulation so that they will play more from the airstream. Okay? One and it's a very difficult thing to do because you realize that the the articulation or the T stabilizes your time. Okay, does everyone understand? It's a, it's a crutch for the time, and people become very dependent on their time because of their tongue. Don't use your tongue at all, okay? One of the, for me, uh, all right, let me say this. Of all the people that ever articulated the heaviest of all the students I've ever had was me, okay? I was the heaviest articulator because Joe Viola, when you went to Berkeley back in the 60s, it was about 75, 80% classical and 20% jazz. Mm -hmm. So he, we really learned a heavy classical background. So I came into jazz using this heavy articulation and then realized it sounded too, it was too much, the T. So I had, so I realized after hearing my first record with the Fringe, I needed to lose that. Then when I started teaching and I listened to these students come in from the Midwest, like, like this. I was like, holy shit. You know, and this is when I'm 1975, I'm just starting to teach and I'm going to myself, oh my God, I'm gonna to listen to this for the rest of my life. I'm gonna shoot myself. So I had to figure out how I could get these guys to lose this articulation. So I, re I figured out a way, and I realized that articulation can come from the fingers just by depressing, putting the pad down. So you get the, the, the actual T would come from here, look. So I, I, I realized that two things that would help. You would play with a really strong, that's great, sounds like they're drilling next door. Uh, is that the phone? <laughs> Maybe they are drilling. So anyway, if you come down, right, if you come down strong, not, not heavy, but strong and even, you could have a finger, artic finger articulation with perfect time and you would have to use the metronome, okay? So it would be like. So what I did was I started to practice this when I was young with the metronome. So I didn't realize I was getting rid of the tongue and working on metronomically perfect time. Now, the big thing I worked on the most, if you ask me, was my time. I did very little with harmonic concept because I realized that harmony comes more from the time than the harmony itself. Okay? You need to know what the harmony is. Like you can't play off of a G7 if you don't know what G7 is. But if, let's say you didn't know what G7 is, you could get through that G7 if you played in good time. You understand what I'm saying? You could play through it time-wise. If you knew what a G7 was, but you couldn't play the time, it means nothing. Be like, hey, tick, 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 <laughs> you know, and no one understands what the hell you're playing. They have given me like, man, what are you doing? Well, that's what I'm doing now, right? So you understand what I'm saying? So the G7 came more from the time from me than it did the chord. And then as I went through life and I learned more and more and more, I started to understand that, okay, G7 is G7, 
but G7 can also be these other things. G7 can be A flat 7, G flat can be D flat 7, G flat could be F sharp minor. It didn't matter because all of these alternate harmonic sounds came from my time. Does that make sense? And we're getting deep now, so. Okay, let, let, let me also say that what I'm telling you today is the way I view the music and how I've learned. You know, every t everyone that comes here, maybe Leadman, maybe Lovano, maybe Chris Potter, or whoever, will have their view of how they see the music. You know, so everyone's different. There's no one person who says, it goes this way, you know. And if anyone ever tells you that, they're, they're not right, they're wrong, it's not correct. But, as far as the time, the most perfect time feel I have ever heard came from Michael Brecker. And when I heard that time feel, that's when I realized that what I was going after was correct from Michael Brecker, you know. You know, I'm sure you all listen to Michael a lot, and his time was flawless. You know, it was perfect. And it, it's from the metronome. Some people like to practice with the metronome. Some people don't like to practice with the metronome. I can tell the people that practice with the metronome, but I can really tell the people that don't practice with the metronome because their time is negative. It just depends on how exact you want to be. Okay? Good Perfect time will never hurt you. Bad time will kill you. Because if you don't have good time, if your time is not solid, no one's going to call you to play because they can't play with you. Especially if you play that instrument right there. If you play the drums, and I tell the drummers, if you don't practice with a metronome, and if you can't play with that metronome when it's off, You've got big trouble. And my son is a drummer too, and that's one of the first things I've told him. You've got to have perfect time. And if you don't, everyone understand that? So even a saxophone player, piano player, you know, you listen to Chick Corea, you listen to, you know, you listen to Coltrane, you know, you listen to people that, the people that attract your ear most of the time are people with good time. I mean, the harmonic thing, no one really understands the harmony. I mean, they can hear divisions of harmony, but when you go into the extended harmony, it's impossible to hear. I mean, even when I'm playing, I don't know what I'm playing. When I listen back to it, I'm like, wow, what the hell is that? And that's what I want. I don't want to understand, because if I know what I'm playing, then it's repetitive. You understand that concept? Because to me, jazz is about newness. It's about being new when you play. Bebop is great. I love bebop. I play it myself once in a while. <laughs> Not too much, but once in a while. But at this point, it's 2013, and it's time for you to look for something else. I don't care what cat, I really don't care what cats play. I mean, you got to understand, not to sound egotistical, but I grew up with Joe Lovano, and my teacher was Frank Tiberi, the mentor of Joe and I. You know, Michael Brecker is a good friend of mine. Liebman is like my blood brother. After that, I've heard everything. There's nothing else for me to hear. I mean, Wayne Shorter, Sonny, of course. But when I play with young guys, I just want them to play with me. I want them to play good time and not try to figure out what I'm trying to play. Just be yourself. And that's something you want to remember. If you play with a really high level musician and you get par you're going to get paranoid about what to play and try to play something you've never played before and then you're going to be negative. But the best thing to do is just be yourself. Just be yourself, okay? Mm -hmm. Remember that. Don't try to be McCoy Tyner, or don't try to be Elvin Jones, because you're not going to do it. Don't try to be John Coltrane. Just be yourself, because if you try to go for something else beyond your expectation, and you're with Dave Liebman, you're going to play 
terrible and he's going to hate you. So you, any time you play, just be yourself. It's a hard thing to do to be yourself. So again, you know, just being yourself is very important and do what you do because if you try to go for something more, you know, it's not going to happen and, and you risk, you know, people remember how you play. People remember when you play great and people remember when you didn't play great, when you didn't play good. It's like when, you know, we're going to go in and, where did, where did he go? Anton, I lost him. He's gone. It was like when I was putting the triadic approach together in the beginning, you know, it didn't sound the way it sounds now. So and I was in trial and error because I didn't figure this out writing it down. I figured it out on the bandstand while I was playing. And that's a very dangerous thing to do because you're exposing yourself to the whole world. You know, and that, but that's what I did because I didn't care because Listening to the people around me, nothing really impressed me other than Lovano or Liebman or people that I respected. And they never said to me, guys, oh, what's that triadic thing, man? That's nasty. If they had said that, I would have, I would have completely reconsidered. But if you notice on the front here, I have a quote from Joe Lovano. And on the back, we have a quote from Dave Liebman. Okay, and that, that for me was a turning point because when J Jody said, oh, let's send this, the DVD to Lovano and let's send it to Liebman so they can hear it and tell me what they think. Well, I knew Joe would be cool because, you know, Joe and I grew up together, but Lieb, Lieb's very, he's intense. He, he either likes it or he hates it. He either likes what you do or he hates what you do. But he wrote, after he heard it, he wrote me a nice email saying, you done good, kid. So I knew it was cool. So after I got the endorsement from both of people that I idolized, I knew I was okay. But through the whole thing, it never really bothered me because, you know, I just went forward. And that's what you need to do when you play. Just go forward. Don't worry about what people think of you. Because if they don't like you, no, if, if they don't like you, but you know you're strong, they don't like themselves. If you know you're strong, you're strong. If the, not, not you, if anybody, I mean, if someone comes up and vibes me, then they're showing me their insecurity. Okay, strength shows strength, but strength also shows insecurity. And that happens a lot when people see something so strong they get very insecure about what they're hearing but you shouldn't be like that you should draw it closer to you it's scary i mean there were years when joe lovano used to scare the shit out of me man when i said how can someone that my age play like a master and but i just he kept drawing me to him you know and we stayed really close friends and until I could stand on my own two feet and play with him, you know, and I admire him for that because of his strength, and he keeps going forward. You know, you know the playing of Joe Lovano. Joe Lovano. <laughs> That's my man. So anyway, any questions? And then I'm going to go into the triadic approach. The, the triadic. This concept took me 25 years to put together. 25 years of, of my life. And for me to tell you in one hour how it goes. No, no, I'm just saying, you know what I mean? You know, you understand? So if I can come back, you know, and do it slowly each day, even in a three-day seminar, you would understand it more. But um, the thing I like about the Russian guys in the Russian culture it's is that they were very serious and very disciplined. Nikolai and Anton, uh, you know, all the guys that came by came in and they were like, Phew. so I could see it was going to be like good. Don't you? <laughs> what, what, what? It was like level of discipline. Yeah. What, who, who, who was the uh, teacher <laughs> of, of these guys before? <laughs> but, you know, knowing 
of course, my man, but knowing the, the, the cultures that seem to be the most di disciplined for me because, you know, at Berkeley, over, I, I was there, I've been there for 40 years. 40 years. I know I don't look that old, but for 40 years, I've been teaching since 1975, and I've seen, you know, um, Japanese, Korean, Israeli, very intense, Israeli students, the Russian students, guys from Peru, Argentina, just everywhere, you know, and the most disciplined cultures were the Israel, the Israelis, the Russian, and the Japanese. And most of the people when they came spoke no English. Zero. Especially the Japanese people. They would come and speak no English and learn how to speak a Boston English. Right? Boston English is like, how you doing? How you doing? That means how are you in Bostonian. It's like a slang. You'll see. Uh, uh, have you been there before? Not really. I mean, uh, when you, you'll see when you come. But so it was up to me not only to try to teach them something, but to help them to understand. And luckily with music, Music is universal, so you could teach them through playing. It was interesting uh, to deal with that. But with the Russian guys, they were very disciplined, very intense, could play many notes, but the one thing I had to teach them was how to slow down and play one note. <laughs> you guys are laughing, right? And I, and I did that. One of the, mo the most in inspiring for me was Nikolai Moyshenko. 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 Yeah. Moyshenko. Moyshenko. He was great because he come in, he could play, and I said, Nikolai, it's time to learn how to play a ballad. He was like, what? <laughs> what what's a ballad? No, 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 he didn't say that. I said, man, we must learn how to play a ballad. And we spent the first two or three lessons, and then after that, that's all we did for the rest of the year, was just play ballads. He loved it. And then he graduated. But I taught him how to play a ballad. Just the melody. You go home and you think about that. And you, you, you say to yourself, how many people do I hear that just play the melody when they play the ballad? Now that I have a better read on you know like you know what I mean that's very dangerous to take intervals like that and try to be in tune. You know, because when you play just the melody, you're holding the notes. It's like the violin. You play a long tone, you play a long note, and you better make sure that you're right on the head, because if you move, but... It's very obvious. So, what I'm showing you, uh, what I tell people to practice, when you pl practice long tone, don't, uh, don't tongue the long note and play the long toe. Play air in like When you let go of the air, just slow down the sound until you lose the sound. Let me show you one, okay? You want to record it? You want to record? Go ahead. That's how I practice long term. And I work on blowing the note down. My feeling is, tell me if you agree with this, it's better to sound a little flat than sharp because my, I can't deal with sharp. So sometimes I'll play. Because 
because I want the lip to be really, really, really loose. Really loose. It's very important to be loose. Can you play a, um, an A flat on that? On that thing there, just the A flat. A flat. One note, A flat. <laughs> See that? So I'm, I'm really not warmed up. Plus, you know, I don't know how you guys are, but in the summertime I go on tour, and the, the, the ability to practice every day is non-existent. So I'm a little bit, I'm looking forward to starting school again in September, so I practice every day. So you can see it with the A-flat, I'm blowing the note down. Eventually I can get there. So I also learned this thing where I would practice. I get up early because I trained with Zen masters all my life and they discipline us to get up at four in the morning. So four in the morning I get up to practice in the dark, no light, no people, no sound. And you have this whole, you have the whole earth to yourself. So I would do these long tones where I would play, start the note with the air, but never play the note. Does anyone do that? No? You understand that? You need translation on that? I would, I would go to play the note, but never sound the note. So in other words, rather than go... I go like this, look. And never play the note. That's control and discipline of your sound. No, really, these are top secret Garzon secrets. I know it sounds crazy, but by not producing the sound, I realized there was a whole world out there of nothingness. There was a non-existent sound that I was learning a lot about. I realized that you work more muscles if you don't produce the sound. No one, no one taught me this. I only realized this in the last few years of practicing in the dark because I live by myself in, a, in America, in the country, in my house. Just me, no kids, no wife, no one, just me. So I can practice whenever I want, yes. <laughs> right? So, you know what I mean? This is the <laughs> this is the benefit of being alone. You know, you're alone, but everyone's alone. Even when you're with someone, sometimes you're alone. But that's a whole other story. But to be in this house, I could get up, you know, because I get up at 3 in the morning to work, and I see more... I see more souls of the people that went before me early in the morning. Because once you turn the lights on, the light takes all of the space. It's a Zen thing that I got into. But I learned so much. And one thing I learned was not to produce the sound. So by holding the sound back, it was more disciplined here. Then when it was time to play the sound... <laughs> nothing and that's not that's a medium volume if I really push forward it would be too loud for your ears okay cool so you can saxophone guys and girls you can work on that and when you hear the sound you can try and bring it but don't let the sound come all the way through So I'll show you. Here's what it sounds like if it does come through. You know, it's not bad. It's not wrong, but the discipline is not to produce the sound. It would be interesting to hear that on violin. You know, like, you'd be like <laughs> can you do that? That would be cool, man. You know, it's these are these are uh, things that people that play free. That's what they do. You know, because after so many, you know, you go to jam session, everybody goes crazy, right? If I'm if I play with a bunch of saxophones and they're like, 
happened? The next guy, <laughs> next guy, <laughs> I'm, I'm like this. <laughs> And it's so different, it's so striking. I have people come out of the audience and they say, my God, what was that? Uh, hello, it's called a long tone. Okay, cool. So let's, let's go to the triadic approach. Oh my God. <laughs> I know it's a free country, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so, hi girls. After teaching and playing with my band, I don't know if you know my band, The Fringe, we play free. We don't play any tunes. Once in a while we play a tune, but we play free. After a while, the students at Berkeley were saying, you know, please teach us how to play free. So how do you... It's hard to teach someone how to play free. So I had to devise a way of being able to play over chord changes, but having total freedom in a non-harmonic way. So I realized that using triads against the chord would not only make an alternate harmony, but support the chord in a non-harmonic way because when you play, if you play a series of triads, it makes beautiful harmony, okay? If you play a series of triads in random order with random inversion and not repeating a triad, you borrow from the 12 tone row, okay? Once you borrow from the 12 tone row, then I realized that you could you could play any note you want as long as it was in a random sense, okay? Now in classical, when the, when the composers write 12 tone music, their, responsible, their responsibility is to use all 12 tones to produce the 12 tone row. But I realized that you could release the 12 tones in one half step. Okay? So what I was saying is, if you could play all 12 tones, then you could play any note. I mean, you could play any chord, and it would, all 12 tones would release the chord because there'll be one note that would sound the chord. So if, let's say he plays a C major triad. Remember we talked about that? <clears throat> right? Now, in the, in the um, traditional way, it would go, go ahead. Okay, so now I realize that if you if you took both random chromatic approach and triads and just played them without repeating yourself, you could you could sound really free of the chord and fr play the chord because there would be one or two notes that would be res would respond to the chord that he's playing. Everyone understand that? So let's try that again. Just sustain that again. Okay, so you can hear in the flurry of sound I'm going in and out. And, but it goes by so fast your ear can't say, relate and say, Oh, he just played the five of the C. Oh, he just played the E. But your ear knows that that happened. You can't pinpoint because I'm not going to let you do that. That's why when people come and listen to me, to me play, they have to listen. You know, when when you and when you go when when musicians go to a gig, they come to hear you play. They want to analyze everything you do. They want to figure out what you're playing. I don't think so. You can't do it with this. It's impossible. You might walk away saying, oh, he played a, a G chord <laughs> or something like that. But if you stay a whole night when we're playing, you walk out of there, you'll be like, what the hell did he just play? And that's what I want. I want you to say, what did he or she just play? Understand what I'm saying? That's my goal, is for you to come and listen to me play. 
and not try to analyze what I'm playing. It's like Coltrane. You know, when you listen to Coltrane play, it, it's so beautiful that you, you can't analyze it. You just want to sit and listen to it. And a lot of what I'm talking about came from Coltrane, but I, I developed my own concept of what Coltrane was playing because there's many secrets that John left, but not too many people really picked up on these secret, secrets. I'll tell you a few now. We have, we have time. I'm cool. We're cool? So it's 5 o'clock? What time's the gig? Oh boy! All right, we're gonna go. We'll, let me get into the triad a little bit. So, Coltrane, his concept was based off of the three tonic system. When you look at Giant Steps, it's based off three three tonic. It was B, E flat, and G, right on Giant Steps, which we'll play tonight. When I looked at that, I, I said to myself, "That's an augmented triad." So why can't you just play all, all augmented triads on giant steps? Just play augmented. So the way I would teach you to play all four groups of triads would be major first, then the minor, then the augmented, and then the diminished with half step in between. I'm, I'm telling you this very fast. So. so the way you would practice each one of these individually would be major triad with half step in between, all right, sound like this. <laughs> Those are major triads in random ver inversion with half step in between. So what happens there is once you play one, three, five, let's say you play D, F sharp, A, you can only go up one half step or down one half step to the next note, but of a different inversion. Major triad, but different inversion. So if you play root position, you can't play root position again. You can't go because that's a repetitive. So you would go really slow and you play. Does everyone understand that? You don't want to play them in a symmetrical uh, movement. And let me tell you people, this is really difficult because it's difficult for me. Still at this point, it's difficult. If I don't practice it, it disappears. It's like I never played it. So you really, when you practice this in the beginning, you practice it really slow. So that you can under you can hear before you get to the next inversion, you can almost see what it's going to be. So when you play ba 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 that note should tell you what the next inversion would be just by that one note alone. So you, you've got to imagine that you're going to do that to all four triads. Okay, so let me just show you quickly what each one sounds like. If you go to minor... <laughs> difference in the sound and that minor is so dark it's almost very classical as a classical sound so you can utilize these things like you play if you're playing in a modal situation like if you play impressions um, 
most of the time when I hear people play, they sound good the first few choruses, but then they repeat themselves. So you, you could use a minor or you could use anything. You could use any one of the tr three situations, major, diminished, augmented, and that keeps the energy going and keeps variation, you know? Over D minor. Play, play just a... These are all the things you heard Coltrane play. It took me 25 years to realize what that was because when I listened to it, it was I couldn't get, I didn't understand. But I, what I had to do was I had to shut out McCoy. I couldn't listen to McCoy and concentrate on Coltrane to realize that a lot of this were, were they were just varied major tri, uh, different varied triads, not just major. You know. There were triads against that chord. When they played together, you can't hear it. It's a disguise. It's too disguised. But I would shut out McCoy. Sometimes I would shut out McCoy. Then I would shut out Train to hear what McCoy was playing against Coltrane. It was wild, man, you know, to, to, to do that because I was driving back and forth from Boston to New York teaching. So I had four hours to be by myself. Back then you had the CD player plugged into the radio and you could hit repeat and then repeat again you know what I mean and take a little section and, and do it and keep doing it not only did I try to understand what he was playing harmonically but the sound of how he played some of that mysterious the spiritual uh, play um, sustain um, um, again like a C minor how Coltrane played that sound and a lot of people didn't go in to, do, to understand that sound. get the spiritual aspect of the sound, not the harmonic, but the spiritual aspect of that sound. It took a long time and, and to be brave enough to do that because, you know, you're, you're trying to go in and do something that Coltrane did. It's, you know, it's scary. It was scary for me. When I was younger, sometimes I would do it and then back away because it was too much. Now I feel a little bit more confident about that, about doing that. People say, oh, you, you sound like Coltrane. And I say, no, I don't. Because when I put on the record and I listen to Coltrane, I'm not even on the same block. I'm not even on the same street. You know, does everyone understand that? Okay, any questions? Now I'm going to... Anton, you're so quiet, man. What happened? We like to play something because it sounds so beautiful. Yeah, I will. I want to show you two things though. Uh, um, he has a question to come. Yeah, the, the question came from Soundcheck today when we played a little with you. And uh, I realized you, you play like all these crazy concepts. But what's most amazing, it's very logical. And the way you end the phrase. It's, uh, I think it's most important, so you can play all, all other stuff. And I end on what? And then, and then you end and resolve it, and uh, it, it has a point. That you, so, like, for, for me, if I'm, I'm trying to do something else, it, and if I'm not resolve it properly, and if it's not logical, it's like, oh, I just play a bunch of crap. But, like, the way you do it, like, it always has a point. Like, you start hearing it, and then you're like, ooh, ooh, what's going on? And then, hop, and then resolve it, like, oh, right. that's nice. That's fine right now for you, but you're going to get to a point, and I got to a point too, where you don't need to resolve it because you can end on flat nine of a one on a ballad, and if you play it with conviction, it's right. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, at some point, it's something you'll come and you'll understand how it goes. It's it's not it's unexplainable. It comes it comes in the strength of how you play it. Okay, it's not what you play. It's how you play it. Я просто говорил о том, что вот он играет все эти сложные свои концепции, да, но самое главное, что он всегда заканчивает фразу логично и разрешает ее. И разрешение это, это как бы основной аспект. Если это разрешить логично и правильно, то все до этого приобретает смысл. Но еще говорит, что важно, можно, можно, можно даже не разрешить правильную ноту аккорда. Но если ты это делаешь с уверенностью, и это и имеет логику, тогда это и имеет воздействие на зрителя. А по логике можно подробно, что значит иметь логику? Организованность на логическую фразу. Теоретическую конструкцию, которая начинается и заканчивается. Вот она начала и закончилась. Еще раз можно сыграть точно так же. И все. На неправильной ноте закончено. Еще раз повторить фразу другую и опять закончить на этой ноте. Вот. Так? Да? Как, как? То есть вам можно вообще не пригодиться? Не можно не пригодиться. Да. Зависит от того, какую то энергию вкладываешь. Да, только что ты Я вот именно про энергию. Как Мне вы... интересно, как вот энергия взаимодействует. Вот что он думает насчет энергии вообще? Как он любит отдавать энергию или он любит больше забирать? Мне интересно. Is he, he's getting deep. No, I get the vibe. The boss is talking, so listen to the boss. <laughs> listen to the boss. You dig? <laughs> he looks very Italian. You have Italian background? He looks very Italian. <laughs> like Vito no, Andolini. Anything you want, whatever you want, I'll do anything for you. Don't worry. Um, so what? What's the? Yeah, Anton was asking about the energy, like how you work with the energy and. Like, uh, what, what do you usually do? You, you give energy or you actually suck in energy from people? I give it to the people that want it and I don't give it to the people that don't want it. Даю тем, кто этого хотят и не отдаю тем, кто не хотят. Sometimes I meet people that give me good energy and some people that I meet people that give me negative energy. I don't take energy from everyone. I don't need to because I worked on energy all my life with the Zen master. So I have my own energy, but sometimes you'll find people that like to drain your energy and I protect myself from that. You know, because you put up like a wall that protects you. Because people can drain your energy. They used to do that to me. They, in English you say, they suck your energy like they... And then at the end you have nothing because you're like this. But I don't do that anymore. It took me a long time. It took me 63 years to learn that. 63 years next month on Coltrane's birthday, my birthday. Happy birthday. Not yet. <laughs> Pretty soon. <laughs> we won't see you then. No, you'll see me. I'll be flying over the sky. Yeah, they want translation. Hey, what? Yeah, I just translate quickly what you would just say. Good. Yeah, we just, uh, он говорил uh, про то, что это у него заняло 63 года, чтобы понять, uh, как, как, каким людям можно отдавать энергию, а каким не стоит, и перед каким людьми может быть uh, имеет смысл не постоянно ставить себя барьер. И, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not like, oh, he has bad energy, so he stays. It's not that. It's, I don't do that with anyone. I accept everyone. But sometimes when you accept everyone, people try to move in for various reasons, you know. And I'm a, fr I'm a very friendly person until you step over the line. And with the Italians, once you step over the line, there's no turning back. Watch The Godfather and you'll understand. <laughs> don't, don't try, you don't have to do that. So, um, let me just do one, one more thing and then we'll play something. All the secrets that I learned about the triadic approach were found in one song that Coltrane played a lot on many records was I Want to Talk About You. Because when I listened to that solo, he played all these ideas and I couldn't figure them out. And when I listened to him and tried to understand, I realized they were triads with chromatic approach in between. It took me a long time, 15, 20 years to re finish, realize that. You know the song?
those are all major tribes. If I slow that down, the major diminished augmented or minor. You know, but when you play all of this fast, it goes by too quick. Your ear can't distinguish. I mean, you might pick up on a few little things, but it's going by so fast. Plus, the other thing is when you add the chromatic approach, which is random too, that disguises the triads. So it's hard to distinguish what exactly everything is. That's why when you listen to Coltrane, you listen to him. You can't analyze that. And if you think you can, forget it because it took me 20 years to understand what he was doing. 20 years. And you hear no one playing like that. Even myself, I don't consider myself to be well aware of what John's playing because the more I learn, the less I know. Okay, and the other secret was, going back to, to Giant Steps, I realized Giant Steps was built off of an augmented triad. So when you play augmented triads with half step in between, I realized that that was Giant Steps. Okay? So if you go home and you practice everything, or if you buy my DVD, <laughs> come on now, if you buy my DVD, it's all in there, okay? So you practice the augmented triads with half step in between, and you're already on the way to playing a random version of Giant Steps, because Giant Steps is found inside of those random augmented triads, okay? So listen to it. I'm just going to play random triads and tell me if you can hear giant steps. This is without listening to the harmony. I'll do it by myself first and then Evgeny will play with me. And when you put the harmony, you can hear it even more, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Into a what? Into a what, man? Okay. So that I mean, even if I went, if, if I went, and in the next DVD will come out soon where I just show augmented and diminished triads, and I did it with Leo Genovese, and we played Giant Steps, it was wild. Let's play Giant Steps again like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, now listen to this. This is just augmented triad with half step in between. Really difficult, but watch how many times we hook up I mean, this, is, this is my prayer to make sure it works. Okay, watch how many times I hook up with the try with what Evgeny's playing. All right, not too fast. One, two, three, and. see how many times and that's just augmented try with half step in between now we'll do the same thing a little bit faster and I'll put chromatic approach and I want to talk about chromatic approach after this and then you'll have the whole pretty much the whole thing
you know, again, not all of it fits exactly, but you can tell it doesn't really matter because we're only playing, if we go, so the quicker the tempo, the more I can get in there, and the quicker the tempo, it's harder for your ear to hear anything, harder for your ear to hear anything. So these are all the things that play into it. Tempo, the speed, um, how, how well you learn what I'm showing you at the slow tempo. Because if you take your time learning slow, it will be better faster. If you don't spend time slow, it's going to be terrible when you play fast. Okay, because you know, well, you, you probably know, Maestro, when you ask the students to practice slow and they never do it. They can't, the students cannot play slow. You understand that? The students cannot play slow. If I say, play a bebop lick for me. They can't do it. It's impossible. I'm telling you it's impossible because I deal with this every day. So what do I have the students do? I make them practice slow. It's torture. It's worse than Chinese torture where they <laughs> one drop of water on, you know. Well, that's, what you, that's what you want to do. You want to torture your students. That's how they learn. Torture is good in music because otherwise you don't learn. You know, if, the, if, if I go, hey, again, you sound great. Oh, man, you, you sound great. Oh, you fucking sound great, man. And he's going to say, this guy is bullshit, man. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, oh, man, you sound great. You sound great. So the chromatic approach is what I put in between the triads. And that's what really gives the, the triads kind of a bebop flow. You sound more like bebop, you know. I still hear giant steps in my head, right? Because if you just play triads, then you would sound too triadic. So you put chromaticism. So I'm just trying to give you the quick version. I, what I call chromatic approach are all the notes in between the major third. Half step, whole step, minor third, major third. That's chromatic approach to me. Because when you go to the fourth or perfect fourth, you start the beginning of the intervallic series. So four, five, six, seven, it's, interval, it's intervallic. It's not wrong, but it's what it is. So what I have the students do is practice all of the intervals in between the major third and be random with those four intervals, half step, whole step, minor third, major third. So I would say like, okay, play between C and E. Don't go lower than C, don't go higher than E. So they, they have just four intervals to be random. <laughs> Okay, so what you do is you play like C to E, then you move to B flat to G, do the same thing. Then you go F sharp to A sharp, do the same thing. C sharp to F. All your major thirds, but only staying in between that distance. And you, you know, it sounds like, oh, I can do that, but when you go in and do it, it's really difficult because there's only four options and you need to be random. Okay, so you practice that, and then the end result is I want you to be able to move up and down the instrument doing the same thing, but you can be free to play up and down, but you can't get larger than a major third. Okay, does everyone understand that? Okay, so let me play that for you. This is just chromatic approach, <coughs> no triad. <laughs>
played one fourth in there. Did anyone hear the fourth? I did. Okay, so you hear that? That's all chromatic approach. If you mix the chromatic approach with the triad, you have everything. Now, if you play that, you can play all of that over any chord. Now, uh, F, let's play, just play an F minor chord. I'm, he's going to play F minor, F, A flat, C, E flat. I'm going to play all major triads. And watch how it doesn't make any difference, major against minor, minor against major. You can do a little slow. Go up an octave, play, there you go. And end on the flat nine on the one minor. <laughs> See, what I did was all, everything that my teachers told me to, at Berkeley not to do, I did. Really? I mean, you know, you learn, I learned the, uh, little, the little that I learned, I learned what to do. You know, you can't play against G minor if you don't know what G minor is. You've got to know what G minor is. Once I figured out what G minor was, then I could play against it. You know, you need to know what G minor is because when you go to the flat nine of G minor, you want to know flat nine is A flat. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You have to know what that is, a half step up. So you need to know the traditional so that you can go outside and it'll, it'll sound much stronger when you know your, your traditional. You've got to know that. You can play free, you can do that, you can do whatever you want, I don't care. You can do whatever you want, but I'm telling you that the freedom will sound much stronger if you have a basic understanding of the traditional background of bebop. Because, like Evgeny said, the resolution is really important. Okay, does that make sense? Everyone understand? I just want to make sure you hear from me. I want you to hear two things from me. Well, three things. The first one is buy that DVD. Okay? <laughs> the second one is make sure you can play traditional bebop, straight ahead, know the scales, the chord tones. You can get everything from the Omni book and the supplement from the Jamie Abersall 251. You know all, you guys know all this, right? The, it's all in that supplement, okay? And then you play along. And then understand, if you need to translate this, uh, either one of you guys, that the concept that I'm showing you involves a lot of notes. And I want you to hear from me, the originator, that the possibility of overplaying is a given. That is going to happen for sure. I'm telling you and you and you and you that if you don't keep an eye on what you're playing, if you learn this concept, you will play too many notes. And the people will yell at you. And then they will blame me because they know they learned it from, you learned it from me, and then I'm gonna call you and yell at you. So make sure you understand that. I'm saying to you that you will use too many notes if you're not careful with this concept. Let's do that. I wanna play a ballad because we talked about so many notes. And I'll try not to play. We'll play one song and then Is everyone coming to the concert tonight? Yeah. Coming to the concert? No, you have to. All you guys, everyone come, really. Then you'll hear me play too many notes. And you'll say, Mr. Garzon, you said that we can't play too many notes, but you play too many notes. <laughs> and I go, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I told you, don't do what I do, do what I do. Can you translate that? Не делайте то, что я делаю. I don't know. It's it's like a it's like a Zen concept, you know, it's like you never get the answer. You never arrive at the answer because it's something you've got to figure out on your own. We'll play um let's put all right go so we get the bells ready. Let's play my one and only love. I gotta get a shot of this after this classic. 
We'll do my one and only love. I'm going to start with just the melody, no, no notes, and then we'll go into it, okay? Understand. Wow. Okay, one, two, three, and... Mm-hmm. 
Well, if they file the reed, it makes the reed brighter, okay? The, the reed will play brighter, okay? So you get a brighter sound. It, depending on the weather, like I can play unfiled or file. So if you play unfiled, they don't cut the reed, they don't file it. So the reed is heavier, but it's also darker. Once they file the reed, it's brighter, yes, but you're already killing the reed. The reed is already dying. You understand what I'm saying? Because they, it lessens the life of the reed, but um, the reed is brighter. But if, if you play a harder reed, if you play like a harder filed reed, you'll get a little more life out of it, you know? It just depends. Like, again, I've been, I was in Peru, the reeds were like toilet paper. They were like, like tissue, you know? And then I played in, in Korea, same thing. I come here, the hard reed is too heavy and the, and the light reed is too light. You know, and this is what I tell the students, you know, you might think you're a bad guy or girl. You might think you're a good player in the practice room, right? Or at your gig or at Wally's or some jam session. But you go out to different countries, you know, you've got to deal with... I heard that. You get a, you you've got to deal with being in a different country. You got to deal with jet lag. You've got to deal with how the reeds play, eating different food, and just not being normal. I mean that to me is the the um, the test of a real musician. It's not you know these kids think they sit in the practice room. Yeah, I'm a motherfucker because I'm in the practice room. I sound killing in the practice room until you open the door and then you go outside and you come into the real world. I was talking to Evgeny, I was in Peru and we went and we climbed Machu Picchu. You know what Machu Picchu is? Machu Picchu is the Inca, the spiritual Inca where the, all the Inca, the Peruvian Indians were. And I didn't realize, they were like, okay, you're going to go to Cusco and, and we're going to go to Machu Picchu. I'm like, cool. So we, first we fly to Cusco, it's 2,000 feet above sea level, so when we get off, there's no air, and we're like, like this, and you have an immediate headache, and you can't breathe, right? And I'm like, oh my God, and you can't sleep, and you're like, I think I'm going to die. Right? And so then we go to Machu Picchu, which was a little lower. I was like, oh, I feel great. So I, then I think, oh, we're going to walk around Machu Picchu. Oh, yes, look at this little church. And then I look up and I realize, and they're like, oh, yes, Machu Picchu is up there. And we must climb. And I had to climb up to see Machu. And I had to do it. It was unbelievable. I swear, I said to myself, for being 63 years old, if I don't die on this trip, I can survive anything. And I did. <laughs> I mean, now, now I can do anything after Machu Picchu. So I'm just saying, as a musician, you're going to see a lot more than just, oh, I play this mouthpiece or I play this ligature. I have this cool saxophone. Oh, you like my sax stand? It's a lot more than that, girls and guys. It's discipline. So if you, 
exercise, I highly recommend you start exercising now because music is the minor of what you're going to do if you go out on the road. You understand? Everyone understand that? Thank you. I'll see you tonight.